This video looks at critical race theory, what it is, what it isn't. It has been much maligned. It's been presented in a distorted, cartoonish way. It's important if you're against something to know what that something is. So let us try to understand critical race theory a little better, starting with what it is not. It has nothing to do with Marxism. It's been connected to Marxism by some groups, and it's usually the word equity. Groups have equated this with Marxism, and that's a bit of a stretch. The term equity here refers to fairness and justice, not equal outcomes, but fairness and justice. That's become kind of a buzzword to scare people very much like they did in the 50s. But critical race theory has nothing to do with Marxism or communism or socialism. Those scary, scary words. It just does not. It does not teach children to hate white people. Boys and girls, today's lesson is how to hate white people. You must hate them. It just doesn't. That's a silly idea. It does not teach children to be ashamed of being white. It just doesn't. Imagine how that lesson would go. Boys and girls, I'm white. You should be ashamed of me. Just does not do that. Saying it so doesn't make it so. And it does not promote the idea that America is bad or George Washington is bad. It just doesn't. Nope, nope, nope. Saying it so doesn't make it so. So let's take a look at what it is. It's a theory. A theory is a way to explain a set of facts. It explains phenomena by connecting the data dots to form a picture. Different theories connect different data dots differently. Here's an example of two theories connecting two different data dots. And critical race theory explains one such phenomenon. It connects a lot of data dots related to systemic racism. Uh, these are uncomfortable conversations to have, but they are necessary for us to have them to continue to, to, continue to evolve our society. It originated in the 70s. Derek Bell, Alan Friedman, Richard Delgado, it came out of the legal system. They were concerned with the slow pace of progress on racial reform. It started in the 60s, but then it kind of slowed down. The protests and the marches, they were having fewer and smaller gains. In the 90s, Gloria Ladson Billing, one of the early scholars, brought this idea of critical race theory into education and used it as a lens to examine the educational system. So it is a lens through which we view things, through which we view our various social systems, the legal system, the economic system, political system, prison systems, educational systems. It examines these and it asks the questions in these systems. Who gains and who is exploited? Who gets the resources? Who is advantaged? How are marginalized populations depicted? Whose voice dominates and whose is silenced and muted? Who's included? Who's excluded? Who gets the opportunity and the resources? Who gets punished more? Who gets the attention? Who's making money? What makes it difficult for some and easier for others? That's the lens through which these different systems are viewed. So, seven big ideas, common ideas, related to critical race theory. And that is an excellent source. I would recommend that book. First, racism is normal. It's so ingrained in our consciousness that most don't see it. I don't see racism, you said. Yes, you don't. But your brain does. Your policies do. Your procedures see racism. It is normal. For change to occur, we must unmask and expose racism.
here's a definition of systemic racism. That means it's all over the systems. Systemic racism has to do with systems, political, economic, legal, judicial, educational, and includes the policies, procedures, rules, laws, regulations, traditions, institutions, and the paradigms, that's our view of reality, that disadvantage people of color while providing an advantage to the white privileged majority in terms of opportunities and resources. That is one view of systemic racism. The second big idea, change will only occur when it aligns with the interests of those in power. For people of color, change will occur only when it consigns, uh, coincides with the changing economic conditions and the self-interest of the 1-5% to of those in power. As an example, Daniel Snyder, owner of the Washington former Redskins, said, I will never, never change that logo, not ever. But then a thing happened. The sponsors started pulling their ads and all of a sudden he had an epiphany. He decided it needed to be changed to the Washington football team. Same with the Milwaukee Bucks during the playoffs. They said, nope, we're not playing. Millions of dollars were at stake. All of a sudden, the NBA said, mm, maybe we might want to take this Black Lives Matter stuff seriously. Change will only occur when it coincides with the interests, the political and the economic interests of those in power. Race is a social construct. It has no basis in biology. It's an arbitrary category based on the physical appearance that society has created. It's based around the idea of this mythical white norm. This is normal if you're not white. It's abnormal. It's a sorting mechanism that creates winners and losers. It's a social construct. No person has a single identity. That's intersectionality. Intersectionality between race and other groups, other marginalized groups, and understanding the oppression and marginalization of one group helps you understand the marginalization and, uh, and oppression of other groups. Understanding what it's like uh, if you're living in poverty or if you've been discriminated against based on ability, that helps us. As well, a black person may be, uh, be a female or a, a LGBT. We don't. No person has a single identity. It's this idea of intersectionality. All people in a category do not think the same way. Physical characteristics by race do not indicate a deeper underlying commonality of shared traits or shared ideas. One famous black person shouldn't be asked to speak for all black people to be a spokesperson for systemic racism. And this is where it gets a little hard to look at, but this idea, the voice of the people must be heard. Their experiences must be honored. Uh, the perceptions, these are essential in making progress towards social justice and racial equity. And there are a variety of ways that people's voices are muted and muzzled. One of them is numbers without context, providing a study, a quantitative study, 63% of, in the 7th percentile, 92% of. Numbers without context provides a distorted reality. And in education, when quantitative research is the only way to use to find causal relationships, that creates a distorted view of reality. It disallows voices. Another powerful way of uh, disallowing voices is the dismembering or misremembering of history. History is described only in terms or through the eyes of the privileged majority. The histories of marginalized groups are misremembered or cartoonish configurations are used, distortions or omissions or blatant misrepresentations of the groups. And these pictures are hard to look at because we know they're real. It's the McGraw-Hill version 
of history that gets repeated over and over again for so many years that we think that is the history of America. Books like these describe a decidedly different view of the history of our country. It's told from something other than a white Eurocentric perspective. These pictures are hard to look at because we know they're true. It happened. This is part of our history. These pictures are hard to look at because we know they're true. This is part of our history. We can't ignore it. Now, this does not say that America is bad or that white people should be ashamed. Absolutely not. It doesn't say we should exclude some history. It simply says we need to fully remember all of American history. There are some really good things that have happened. But remembering all of U.S. history, that's how we continue to evolve our thinking and continue to evolve our society. Now, developmentally appropriate. We would not present pictures like this to an elementary classroom. Absolutely not. What we present of U.S. history is developmentally appropriate. So don't get all whooped up about that. Again, we're not saying that you should not include important historical events. Absolutely not. Simply says that we need to provide the whole story, not just part of the story, not just the story told through the eyes of a white Eurocentric perspective, but the whole story. And the last idea, cultural superiority and a mythical norm are factors in maintaining systemic racism. It's a reifying factor. The idea that one's own culture is the correct one and that's to be used as a standard of comparison that's called cultural parochialism this says the practice the customs the lifestyles the views and values that do not align with the dominant white culture are defective or deviant or inferior right and wrong good and bad normal and abnormal are all determined by the majority white culture white superiority. Now this does not say that white people are bad or that white culture is bad. Absolutely not. It doesn't say that. It says that it should not be the norm to which all others are evaluated. That is what it's saying. And here's the fallacy. The fallacy that there's a standardized way that things should be. They should be like us. We're right, you see. If only they were like us, all their problems would go away. If they had our values, our views, our way of life. If they would just assimilate like my grandfather, the Norwegian did in 18, everything would be fine. Our values are the right ones. All right, this does not say again that white people are bad or white culture is bad. It just said that it should not be the norm to which all others are evaluated. It should not. Now, these are some of the sources I use. And here are the seven big ideas. Now, if I got one of these wrong, let me know. Let's focus on the idea. This is how we move the conversation forward. Not through hyperbole, not through demagoguery, but by focusing on the ideas. If you disagree with one of these ideas, let me know. Critical race theory. 